Scramblers are one of the most popular flat rides around. The first Scrambler was built by Richard Harris in 1938, and he later sold his patent to the Eli Bridge Company, who later went on to develop most of the Scramblers we find today at amusement parks and carnivals. And these flat rides are extremely popular. The ride consists of three arms that spin in a circle, and each arm consists of four vehicles that also spin in their own circle, resulting in a dizzying ride experience for all riders. Typically, I skip scramblers because I've ridden so many of them throughout the years. But I always make it a point to ride one when they're enclosed. The experience becomes even more disorienting in the dark, especially when it's accompanied by lights, fog, and music like it often is. And chances are if you've seen an indoor scrambler, it was in the Northeast. I have yet to encounter an enclosed scrambler outside of the Northeast. In this video, I will cover what makes the indoor scramblers of Ridden so special, theorize why more parks don't do it, and discuss the impact on the amusement industry. The first documented indoor scrambler I could find was actually located outside the Northeast, and it was located at Astroworld. After building a scrambler in 1968 called The Happening, Astroworld thought outside the box and decided to enclose the scrambler indoors in 1970, calling it the Orbiter. A year later in 1971, The Great Escape followed in Astroworld's footsteps and placed a scrambler inside a dome with lights and music, calling it Chipper's Magical Mystery Tour. Guests had no clue what they were about to experience and reviews were very positive for the New York amusement park. In 1976, a trio of indoor scramblers opened after noticing the popularity of Astroworld's Orbiter and Great Escape's Magical Mystery Tour. Funtown USA in Saco, Maine opened the Astrosphere. The ride had a custom remix of electronic light orchestras or ELO's Fire on High combined with lights, lasers, projections, and fog. And one of the most unique things was that it wasn't a preset show. Operators actually had the ability to adjust the visuals much like a DJ. Compared to the other scramblers I'll go over, this one is by far the slowest, but that's deliberate. Since Astrosphere is arguably the most impressive show, the slower speed allows you to better appreciate the visuals. Seabreeze in Rochester, New York also opened the Gyrosphere in 1976, and it also ran ELO's Fire and High. The ride had psychedelic imagery that was described as an acid trip by many riders, as the dome had projections of snakes, rats, eyeballs, and pyramids and Conneaut Lake Park in Pennsylvania also opened the ultimate trip in 1976. The ride was placed in the building of their former funhouse that closed the year prior. The ride had mirrors, black lights, strobe lights, and loud rock music to enhance the experience. Canopy Lake Park in Salem, New Hampshire added their own indoor scrambler with the Psychodrome in 1989. This is one of the fastest indoor scramblers on this list and it has the usual loud music and light show to accompany it, although the light show isn't quite as strong as the others on this list. The ride also used to have fog, but it no longer operates with it. Lake Compounds in Bristol, Connecticut added the tornado in 1998 after seeing the popularity of the Astrosphere and Psychodrome at nearby parks. This one had loud music, strobe lights, and neon lights. I believe Lake Compounds was also inspired by the nearby Mind Scrambler at Playland Park in Rye, New York. I couldn't find an opening year for this one, but I believe it existed before Tornado. This was another one combining lights, music, and a fast ride. Casino Pier in Seaside Heights, New Jersey adds Centrifuge in 2003. This one had a disorienting tunnel before boarding, a fast operating speed, and the loudest music of any ride in this list. Plus, it also had a decent light show. This is the last indoor scrambler I could find being added at a U.S. park. Of these nine rides, only four remain. By most accounts, they were incredibly popular among park guests. So what happened? First, scramblers do not have the best capacity. They only have 12 cars, so each cycle can only accommodate 12 parties. When the ride is outdoors, that's not too much of an issue. Not every guest will want to ride your typical scrambler. I'd be hard pressed to name a time I had to wait more than a cycle for an outdoor scrambler. But when you place a scrambler indoors, it suddenly becomes much more appealing. There's an aura of mystery around the ride. 
and it results in a much more memorable ride experience that people talk about. Yet the capacity gets no better. In fact, it sometimes gets worse. Depending upon how the park has to load and unload the dome, they may not be able to load the next riders until it's cleared out. On average, I've probably had to wait about a half hour to ride most of the indoor scramblers on this list that I've personally experienced. Long slow lines don't endear a park to guests, but I think the more problematic issues were a series of accidents, most of which occurred between 1999 and 2007. The first was on the orbiter at Astroworld. I cannot find an official report, so this is all hearsay. But there are multiple rumors that the ride had an accident, which ultimately spurred the park's decision to move the attraction outdoors, renaming it the Runaway Rickshaw. The attraction operated outdoors until Astroworld removed it after the 2005 season, sending it to Six Flags Over Texas, where it now runs as the Sidewinder. The first confirmed accident with one of these rides occurred in 1999. A teenage employee working Lake Compounds' tornado slipped and fell while the ride was in motion. The other employee hit the emergency stop, but it was not before the first employee was crushed to death by the ride. At the request of the family, the ride was removed after the 1999 season and replaced by Twister. The second confirmed accident occurred in 2004. A seven-year-old girl riding Ride Playland's Mind Scrambler was killed after she opened her restraint mid-ride and fell out and got crushed. That same year, Connie at Lake Park closed their Ultimate Trip Scrambler. It's unclear if it closed before or after the Mind Scrambler accident, but I suspect it may have been afterwards. Connie had previously moved Ultimate Trip outdoors in 1990 so the ride building could be used for storage. In 1999, Connie moved the Scrambler back indoors and restored Ultimate Trip to its former glory until closing it during the 2004 season. The year after the Mind Scrambler accident, Great Escape decided to move the Scrambler from their Magical Mystery Tour ride outdoors, leaving the old dome empty and idle. Could it have been linked to the Mind Scrambler accident? There's a decent chance since Great Escape is in the same state as Ride Playland and the timing is awfully suspicious. Tragedy again struck Rye Playland's Mind Scrambler in 2007 when a 21-year-old operator was killed after the ride started prematurely by the second operator. The fallout from this accident caused the Mind Scrambler ride to be removed. Seabreeze, which was in upstate New York, decided to remove their gyrosphere after the 2007 season. The park cited declining popularity and low capacity as the two main reasons but the timing after a fatal accident in the same state makes me think otherwise. Because Gyrosphere appeared to still have been beloved by guests. When the ride's original dome was damaged in a 1994 fire, Seabreeze replaced the dome. Around this time, they replaced ELO's Fire on High with modern dance music. When Gyrosphere closed in 2007, it had been running to root Sandstorm. After 2007, only three indoor scramblers remained in Canopy Psychodrome, Funtown's Astrosphere, and Casino Pier's Centrifuge. And another one was lost in 2012. Centrifuge was destroyed in Superstorm Sandy, the storm that ravaged Casino Pier. However, the ride was so beloved by guests that Casino Pier brought Centrifuge back for the 2019 season. In 2013, Great Escape actually moved their scrambler back indoors as well. The old gold dome was painted in icy blue and the ride was renamed Blizzard. There was no real ice theming, unless you count the air conditioning, but the ride received an immediate popularity boost with the light package and booming pop music. In 2019, Funtown invested heavily in Astrosphere, suggesting the ride is going nowhere anytime soon. They replaced the old vinyl dome with a concrete dome and upgrade the light and sound show. This addition made an already great attraction even better. It's easily the best scrambler in the world in my opinion. So today, if you want to ride an indoor scrambler, you can find them at Funtown, Canopy, Great Escape, and Casino Pier. But you are able to find a few other indoor flat rides across the country that very well could have been inspired by the indoor scramblers. In 2019, Six Flags New England adds Cyborg, an indoor chance freestyle. It's not nearly as dark as the scramblers I previously mentioned, 
but the enclosed building leads to several near misses and gives the ride a unique feel. One other interesting thing about Cyborg is that this is the same building that used to be home to Joker's Wild Card, an indoor chance wipeout that ran from 2000 to 2003. The ride closed due to ventilation issues with the Massachusetts Fire Safety Codes. This led to Joker's Wild Card being moved outdoors a few years later, and the ride was later renamed Kryptonite before it was removed. But the ride was far more popular when it was indoors, which is why Cyborg was added in 2019 after the issues with the local fire codes were resolved. Two Pennsylvania parks also added indoor Himalayas. In the 1980s, Del Grosso's purchased the old Caterpillar from Lakemont Park and enclosed it in a dome with a disco ball, lights, and music, naming it the Space Odyssey. The ride operated until 2011 and was quite popular. In 1998, Knobles opened the Cosmotron, an indoor Himalaya. It's a rather small Himalaya and not overly fast, but the loud music and lights more than make up for that. In the Midwest, there are two indoor flat rides I could find. One still remains, and the other has been removed. The then Paramount Kings Island unveiled Tomb Raider the ride in 2002, a Huss giant topspin with multi-sensory effects. Those who rode the ride in its original state were blown away with how theatrical this flat ride was. Unfortunately, Cedar Fair's purchase of this park in 2006 was the beginning of the demise of this ride. The ride was rethemed to the crypt and many of the effects were removed over the years, until the ride reached the end of its service life after the 2011 season. By then, the ride was running in total darkness. Meanwhile, Worlds of Fun still operates Cyclone Sam's an indoor chance wipeout ad in 1995. I rode this in 2018 and loved it. There is almost no chance I'd ride a normal wipeout outside my home park, but Cyclone Sam's gave a memorable ride with the near misses with the ceiling, disorienting spinning in the dark, and projection effects. Out at Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk on the west coast, you can find Wipeout, an indoor husk break dance with lights and music. Break dances are even more intense than scramblers, so experiencing one of these in an enclosure with the multi-century effects was incredible. Scramblers will continue to be a mainstay at amusement parks, as will flat rides in general, but I would love to see more parks at indoor flat rides since they really augment the ride experience. It's clear they're popular among guests. Look at 2019 when Casino Pier brought back Centrifuge, Funtown renovated Astrosphere, and Six Flags New England added Cyborg. I'm just surprised the concept hasn't spread much outside the Northeast, even though it originated in Texas from what I can find. If I missed another indoor scrambler or another indoor flat ride, definitely let me know, because I'm a big fan of taking an ordinary ride and making it extraordinary. That's a quick history on the indoor scrambler and its impact on the industry. What are your thoughts about scramblers, indoor scramblers, or any indoor flat ride in general? I would love to hear your comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate if you gave this video a like and considered subscribing because there'll be a lot more amusement park and roller coaster videos here at Canopy Coaster. Thanks for watching.